discuss some of the immunosuppressive drugs that are commonly used to suppress the immune system in patients who have received an organ transplant. The first of these is called cyclosporin, and cyclosporin is a calcineurin inhibitor. The other calcineurin inhibitor is tacrolimus, and we'll discuss tacrolimus next. So these two drugs are calcineurin inhibitors. However, the difference between them is how they inhibit calcineurin in terms of the mechanism through which they act in the cytoplasm of the T cell. For cyclosporin, the way this works is that the cyclosporin binds to cyclophilin, and this complex of calcineurin and cyclophilin is going to inhibit calcineurin. So why is an inhibition of calcineurin an important effect to suppress the immune system? Well, calcineurin is an important molecule that activates NFAT, and NFAT is a transcription factor that's necessary to turn on IL-2 production. So again, as we've recently said, IL-2 is really, really important because it's released from helper T cells, and it activates other helper T cells, and it also activates cytotoxic CD8 T cells. So IL-2 is a critical component of mounting an immune response. So again, cyclosporin, when it's bound to cyclophilin, is going to inhibit calcineurin, and calcineurin is really important for turning on NFAT, which is the transcription factor that turns on IL-2 production. Again, the way this works is that if cyclosporin is around, you have inhibition of calcineurin, and thus inhibition of NFAT, and thus inhibition of IL-2 production. Now, again, this is going to be used to suppress organ rejection, and also going to be used for long-term maintenance of immunosuppression in patients with either an organ transplant or with a severe autoimmune condition. Major toxicity of cyclosporin is going to be nephrotoxicity, so a decrease in renal function. They also get, obviously, predisposed to certain infections, namely viral infections, and there's also an increased susceptibility to lymphoma. Now, the next of these two calcineurin inhibitors, as I said, is tacrolimus. Now, tacrolimus is similar to cyclosporin in that it is a calcineurin inhibitor. However, it works a little bit differently. The way this drug works is going to be by binding to FK binding protein, uh, and this complex, so the FK binding protein plus tacrolimus, is going to inhibit calcineurin. And as we said before, inhibition of calcineurin causes inhibition of IL-2 production. So this again is going to be used as a potent immunosuppressant in patients who have undergone organ transplant. Major toxicity, just like cyclosporin, is going to be nephrotoxicity. And these patients also will develop peripheral neuropathy, hypertension, and hyperglycemia. Zerolimus works a little bit differently. It is not a calcineurin inhibitor. Rather, it works by binding to a molecule called mTOR. Now, mTOR is a necessary part of the pathway within the cell, whereby activation of the IL-2 receptor causes the T cell to proliferate. So mTOR is a part of that cellular signaling pathway from IL-2 receptor activation all the way down to T cell proliferation. So if you block mTOR, you've effectively blocked that pathway. These patients also get some bone marrow suppression with both thrombocytopenia as well as leukopenia. The good thing about serolimus is that there really is not a very big risk of nephrotoxicity. Next we have diclizumab, and diclizumab is a monoclonal antibody with high affinity for the IL-2 receptor. So, so far you can see a common theme here. All of these drugs have in some way effectively inhibited IL-2. This one is the most straightforward mechanism in that it's simply an antibody against the IL-2 receptor. Next, we have azathioprine, and azathioprine is an antimetabolite precursor of 6-mercaptopurine, or 6-NP. Now, this is a drug we're going to discuss in a future lecture when we talk about chemotherapy, but both 6-NP and azathioprine are purine analogs that are going to interfere with the synthesis of nucleic acids. And obviously, rapidly proliferating lymphocytes are going to rely on very rapid DNA replication. Okay, and with purine analogs around, that DNA replication is stifled, and you're going to have toxicity to any proliferating lymphocyte. This is usually used for kidney transplants. It's sometimes used for autoimmune disorders, such as glomerulonephritis, hemolytic anemia, or even Crohn's disease. Major toxicity here is going to be bone marrow suppression. Really, really important to remember to monitor the white blood cell count in these patients. In addition, the active metabolite, which is mercaptopurine, 
gets metabolized by xanthine oxidase. Now that should ring a bell in your head as the molecule that gets inhibited by allopurinol. And so if a patient is taking both allopurinol and azathioprine, they can end up having huge amounts of the drug left over in their system. And so you want to avoid azathioprine in any patient who's on allopurinol to treat gout. Next we have muromonab, also known as OKT3. It has CD3 on it. And CD3 is a molecule that's very important for intercellular signaling. So if you block CD3, T-cells are not able to receive signals from other T-cells and therefore are not going to be able to mount any immune response. So this drug, because it's so very powerful and because it stops the immune system so potently, is really only used for immunosuppression immediately following transplantation surgery, so literally only in the first day or two. And it's also used to treat an episode of acute rejection. Major toxicity here is going to be something called a cytokine release syndrome, which, as you can imagine, is going to create a lot of inflammation and damage in the body. And the reason that this can occur is because usually when you first administer this drug, you can initially cause some T-cell activation before you cause T-cell suppression. Important to keep in mind. Now, we also have a number of recombinant cytokines that are produced synthetically in the laboratory, and these cytokines are used for a variety of clinical reasonings. The first is called adsoleucan, and alsoleucan, it's basically a recombinant interleukin-2, or IL-2. And so we generally use aldosleucan for renal cell carcinoma, as well as metastatic melanoma. Then we have erythropoietin, or epotin, and as you may know, this is used for treating chronic anemia associated with chronic kidney disease. Erythropoietin causes the bone marrow to pump out new red blood cells. Then we have filgrastin, and filgrastin is also known as granulocyte colony stimulating factor. And we use this for neutropenic patients who have failure of their bone marrow. And this drug actually causes the bone marrow to start producing a larger amount of neutrophils. We also have sargramostin. And sargramostin is granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. So this one, just like filgrastin, is actually going to cause recovery of the bone marrow as well, with a particular emphasis on causing increased production of macrophages as well as granulocytes like neutrophils. Next, we have alpha interferon, and alpha interferon is used in the treatment of hepatitis B and hepatitis C, as well as Kaposi's sarcoma in HIV patients. Beta interferon is used pretty much exclusively for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And lastly, gamma interferon, as you might expect, is going to be used to treat chronic granulomatous disease. Now, as we already said, chronic granulomatous disease is going to be caused by the inability of neutrophils to produce NADPH oxidase and a respiratory burst. So you can imagine that giving back large amounts of gamma interferon is going to help to activate all of these immune cells that are actually usually in trouble because they don't have enough oxidative burst around. So giving them the extra interferon gamma gives them a little bit of an extra edge in trying to fight an infection. Then we have something called oprovacin, or oprovacin is interleukin-11. And interleukin-11 is something that actually causes an increase in platelet production from the bone marrow. So in a patient with thrombocytopenia, you may give them oprovacin in an effort to cause a higher number of platelets circulating in the bloodstream. A similar purpose can be served by administering a drug called thrombopoietin. To wrap up this lecture, we're going to talk about a number of therapeutic antibodies that are used in various clinical settings, particularly with regard to organ transplant or for autoimmune disease. Now, there's a picture on your screen now that shows you the different clinical uses of some of the most commonly tested monoclonal antibodies. The first we already discussed, and that's neuromonab. And neuromonab is OKT3. And again, this is going to be an anti-CD3 antibody, again, used to prevent or to treat acute transplant rejection. Then we have diclizumab, which we also already mentioned as being an anti-IL2 receptor antibody again, used to prevent acute rejection of renal transplant. One that we did not talk about so far is digoxin immune FAB. And as you might expect, this is going to bind up digoxin, and so we use it to treat acute digoxin intoxication. Infliximab is an anti-TNF-alpha monoclonal antibody used for Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Any one of those diseases is characterized by an revving up or an overexcitement of the immune system, 
And one way to sort of tone that down is going to be to create an antibody against TNF-alpha, which is one of the major inflammatory circulating cytokines that's responsible for the destruction and tissue damage carried out by these autoimmune conditions. Now, adalimumab is another drug that's also an anti-TNF-alpha antibody. So both infliximab and adalimumab are anti-TNF-alphas, and adalimumab is used for the same conditions I already listed that are used for infliximab. Then we have something called trastuzumab, which is also known as Herceptin, and trastuzumab is going to have its target as the ERB-B2 protein. Now, HER2, H-E-R2, is a gene that's sometimes overexpressed in certain breast cancers. And when you have overexpression of the HER2 gene, you get increased production of the protein ERB-B2. Now, if a patient has a cancer that is overexpressing this HER2 and producing too much ERB-B2, using an anti-ERB-B2 monoclonal antibody, such as trastuzumab, can be quite helpful in treating the tumor. Lastly, we have rituximab, which is this anti-CD20 antibody. And CD20 is a cell surface marker that is seen on the surface of all circulating B cells. So if you're able to design an antibody, such as rituximab, against CD20, you're going to have peripheral destruction of B cells. So this is good for any condition that's basically characterized by either too many or overactive B cells. Classic example for rituximab treatment would be a B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that concludes our lecture, and hopefully now you have a better understanding of the immune system as a whole.